This episode is brought to you by MPB. Get cash for the kit you're not using or trade it in for the gear you want at mpb.com. Hey folks, in this interview, we're gonna be talking about brand video and changes in the industry. This is Twitter. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today, I have the opportunity to sit down with a longtime good friend of mine, uh, a friend that is on the other coast of the United States. I'm in California. She's in New York City. We're going to be talking about brand video. Her name is Megan Cunningham, and she runs a little company over there, which we're going to find out. It's not little. It's actually kind of big. But we're going to talk about all this stuff. We have a list of things to talk about. But before we do any of that, we're going to catch up a little bit. Megan, you and I have not spoken in forever, at least not verbally. I mean, maybe an occasional email. I'm a stalker of your email list. One of the few emails, email lists that I stay subscribed to is yours. So thank you for that. Um, Let's talk about let's talk about you. So who is Megan Cunningham and let's talk about your company and what it is that you bring to the world with in the in how long you've been doing it. You've been doing it for for a couple of years now, right? <laughs> Just a few. Yes. Just a few. <laughs> yeah, man, I feel like Frederick, you're one of my oldest friends in uh in the business, which is so it's such a pleasure to be here with you. So thank you so much for having me. But um You're welcome. Yeah. I mean, Magnet is um, a brand storytelling studio, and um, it was something that I launched 20 years ago. It was my second startup. And um, at the time, I mean, brand storytelling was not really a known um, part of marketing strategies. And so over the last two decades, it's obviously grown. Um, and now I would say it's much more of a mainstream belief that advertising is increasingly blocked, skipped, avoided. Um, and storytelling is increasingly shared and searched for and celebrated. And so on a strategy level, I think you're seeing a lot of advertising dollars and thinking and time and energy um, being replaced by storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and yet storytelling is still sort of an unknown discipline in the business world. It's, it's a lot of... Um, you know, conversations about narrative and um, or more tactically thinking about growth marketing and which platform we should be on. And um, I think somewhere in the middle is where Magnet sits. Um, we like to think and do, you know, we're, we're very actionable in, um, you know, the fact that we produce hundreds of, of videos and, and podcasts and all the other things that come with um, brand storytelling um, uh, over the course of the year. But uh, we also really try to think like, you know, what is the key outcome that a brand is looking for? What does success look like? Um, how can you differentiate and stand out and tell a story that, um, that matters? That's our mission, telling stories that matter. Yeah, and and that's that's we get it. We have to dive into that because that, that is fascinating to me. Because you know my background is marketing. I love marketing. I'm a solopreneur now. I'm a podcaster, photographer, all these things. Um, I hate to use the phrase content creator because it sounds like, you know, I'm working at Dunkin' Donuts making donuts, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> time to make the content, right? <laughs> well, creators are are all all the hip all the way rage right now it's the creator economy i don't know if you've got the memo so. i got the memo i got the but i'm you know i'm skating to where the puck is going to be not where it is now right? I, like so. it. I like it so let's talk about that let's talk about uh brand storytelling and put a finer point on that so when when you look at it so let's let's paint a hypothetical acme incorporated selling widgets and they approached magnet media to help them get the word out about their brand what's different about digital storytelling and brand storytelling versus you know traditional like i'm going to approach them with a marketing plan and we're going to do a campaign on this we're doing email and social and yada 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 we're doing all these things how do you approach it from a brand storytelling standpoint yeah I'll answer that in two ways. I think the key in some ways is our approach where essentially we have a think, make, reach model. So we're not just sort of um, holistic, you know, we're not, um, we're, we try to be more holistic about it. We're not so siloed in terms of 
what kind of story should we make? Is it a display or a, you know, a, a video or a podcast or a virtual event? We try to think much more broadly around what is the strategy um, to solve this marketing challenge and to unlock the opportunity. Um, and, and a lot of that starts with data. So we look at you know, competitive data, we look at audience data, um, and that from that think, we then inform the make and you know the make again can be um social assets it can be working with influencers it can be working with celebrities or brand ambassadors or real people and telling personal stories which are often the most powerful um types of brand storytelling um and then on the reach side it's a question of you know how are you going to get the message out there because we all know that so much content is produced content Mm -hmm. every day, like the donuts. Um, and, you know, and it's wasted and it, and it just goes out there without anyone seeing it, everyone, anyone knowing um, that it exists. And so we try to put a plan together at the start of the, of the effort around um, how, you know, not just what content, but why it should exist and what's the story that they're telling and who they're telling it to. And then how can we get it out there in the most expedient way that really creates a flywheel and is shared um, socially and, and searched for um, globally. Yeah, and that, and that's that's the thing I was I went to hit on with you because it's the, you look at some of the changes that have happened in the industry over the past a decade or so. I mean, we've got, you know, these things, cell phones that do some amazing things now. I mean. You know, with the iPhone 13, you've got pro level features that people can, you know, generate this content with. Whereas before it used to take a professional to be able to do that. Now it's in our pocket. Right. We've got distribution mechanisms with Facebook and Instagram and all that. Whereas before there were gatekeepers that, you know, you had to like beg or pay a lot of money in order to get in front of a group of people. The, so the barriers to entry have changed a little bit. The tools that we use have changed a lot. How does Magnet play into that? And, and you know, the social world, the, the maturation of tools and all that stuff. How do you leverage that to push a brand that comes to you that needs your help? How do you use that stuff to get to push the ball forward? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on where the brand is at in terms of their level of um, maturity. But, you know, almost everyone is missing some opportunities. That's just the nature of, you know, again, how, how you've um, described it. The audience is so fragmented. So you mm -hmm. can always gain incremental um you know, reach, I would say the question is, you know, how do you do that in a way that does it that's more than a one to one investment of um, incremental spend. And so I think that, you know, we try to create um, the qualitative side um, of, you know, emotional storytelling that people traditionally associate just at the top of the funnel with, you know, I want to have an emotional connection to my brand, that's branding, right? Mm -hmm. um, but actually what we found in our recent report at the State of the Story, which is a, a, a report that we come out with um, four times a year, and we just did the, the video um, chapter last week, that in fact, one of the big shifts in marketing this year and in video storytelling is that video is being used at every stage of the customer journey. Um, and so you're finding that it's not just that emotional storytelling that is generating awareness, um, but it's also in consideration. It's also at purchase. It's also at advocacy after purchase. So, and, you know, engagement and retention. And so I think that um, what's exciting to me about um, not just the tools that, that you mentioned already, which um, are so incredibly powerful and democratizing and have, you know, created a whole new economy of creators. And I, I don't think that that's going away. Um, but actually, they're also now, um, it's changed the landscape for branding because you can experiment in a lightweight way. You can mm -hmm. um, produce stories um, very, very creatively. Um, you know, there's things that you can make on, on your phone um, that, you know, have the power of visual effects that, you know, when you and I were starting out in the industry, it would have taken, you know, $100,000 to try to pull that off. And people are now doing it for free, like on a, you know, channel that they own um, because yeah. the technology is, 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 is that accessible. Um, so that's all a very long winded way to say that I think that um, there's a lot of endless possibilities that the technology has enabled and empowered from a creative standpoint for brands to innovate. And innovation is the thing that cuts through the clutter.
Yeah, yeah, and and we're seeing, you know, with that with that the technology changes and evolution, we're seeing brand new ways to innovate. Some are on the horizon, some are here now. I mean, we got 360. Remember 360 video back in the day? Remember when Apple was first experimenting with it with QuickTime <laughs> VR and all that stuff and the whole promise of being able to attend a concert, but you don't have to be Now all that stuff is here and it's streaming live and you have all these things you've got augmented reality like apple is rumored to be coming out with these glasses that will allow you to look at stuff and get data overlaid on top of it it just goes on and on and on i'm curious you would you know knowing what i know about you and the way that you you approach business with the company and you're forward leaning into this stuff how do you see that those things playing their way into professional marketing and brand storytelling and all that are they distractions or are they kind of a vector that you need to pay attention to that's gosh that is such a great question um i mean i do think and by the way thank you for that compliment of saying that we've you know sort of had the pulse of where things are headed we try we mm -hmm. definitely try and it's because of of uh, <laughs> really um profound thinkers like yourself who always always really are are looking ahead and not just um you know sort of uh, satisfied with the way things are, but, you know, kind of wanting to push the envelope. Um, yeah. and, and so I think that there is an element of sort of shiny object, like, oh, this is new and cool. And like, everybody wants to like run to it and get out and jump on the bandwagon. Um, if it's not connected to the brand strategy and to the storytelling, um, approach. And so I think that, Brands should be looking in the mirror and saying, okay, like, does this, op is this presenting an opportunity um, that makes sense for us? Um, and if so, how would we know that? Right. But at the same time, I think it's absolutely mandatory to say yes to some of those new technologies every single year intentionally. Um, because if you're truly just reflecting back on, and looking at yourself in the mirror, you're going to be a blockbuster or a Polaroid. And, yeah. you know, we all know that those were dominant brands at different points in those corporate histories. Um, and they probably had a chance. I know that that blockbuster had a chance to even buy Netflix at one point. Um, and they said, oh, the streaming future it's not really there yet it won't be there yet you know and and who who did this you know this red envelope dvd mailing company think they are um you know <laughs> that they yeah. really didn't have a um any faith and confidence that they could ever be upended and i think by the time that they did you know it was they were too far behind um and so i think that that happens to a lot more often <laughs> than people would think and so i think you know having hubris and um, you know, not approaching things with too much of a sort of self-congratulatory, like we're the leader and we're going to stay the leader inevitably um, attitude is critical um, to maintain a, a leadership position um, and to really intentionally experiment with at least one or two brand new, like, you know, it could be a failure, like we're okay if this fails, no one's going to get fired kind of attitude um, to experiment is absolutely essential in a modern marketing universe. I agree. I agree. And I try to approach some of the things that I do here at a smaller scale with that kind of mindset of giving my per myself permission to fail, yeah. quote, fail, right? Because there is no failure, right? Giving yourself permission to fail through the positioning of what you're doing as experimental, right? I'm going to try this. I'm going to see if it works. If it works, great. If not, it's not the end of the world versus like the my old Apple employee brain of it has it has to be perfect, it has to be better than perfect before it gets the release to the world or else all hell will break loose. How do you engender that inside your company? How do you engender that the freedom to experiment, especially as things are kind of ramping up now again, there's more and more crazy things coming out. How do you how do you build that in at the DNA level in giving give people the permission to try new things and not be afraid of failure, you know, through it not being exactly Apple esque perfect? Yeah, um, God, that's a, it's an ongoing challenge. If I'm yeah. candid about it, I think that um, we all get so consumed 
with, you know, sort of the best practices mentality of like, oh, like I just learned, you know, this new idea from this other person who was also really successful. So let's just replicate that and like kind of stay the course and we'll just continue to be successful. Um, and so I do think there is a, um, there needs to be an intentional um, break from, you know, just, perf you know, sort of seeking excellence and from, you know, sort of always um, building on your wins and, and just doing more of the things that you know are going to be successful in order to break out of your own sort of ecosystem or your own echo chamber, rather, you know, mm -hmm. it's like I'm just feeling like you're going to um, just spin that wheel. Um, and fortunately, I mean, I feel like, you know, the one thing about Magnet is we have a culture of that we try to foster and it's, it's not always successful, but we really try to foster a culture of psychological safety um, where people feel trusted and respected um, and where, you know, a, a good idea can come from anywhere. Um, and so with that, you know, we have brought onto the team, not only amazing interns, but also apprentices. And so even though we have a lot of senior leaders at the top, you know, of their game and, you know, they are, are leading the charge with all of our client work, of course, behind the scenes, there may be some, um, you know, sort of ideation work or draft work or, you know, just sort of experiments that aren't necessarily um, work that we would sell to a client, um, but that enable us to um, be more fluid and flexible and that, you know, we're not um, risking um, a, a client relationship or frankly client dollars on something that we don't know is going to be proven. Um, and so that's sort of the, the um, style that we have um, and, and system that we've set in place. And then we also try to do, you know, at, at an annual offsite, we also try to do an intentional like experiment where the whole company is involved, where it's really just getting out of your comfort zone um, and making something that is true to our mission of telling stories that matter, but in a way and on uh, in a medium that you've never experimented with before. Um, and so I think that type of um, sort of structure and putting, um, a, you know, like, again, a, a, a safety um, net within mm -hmm. <laughs> within the experiments um, is a way to um, encourage people to just think differently and and, and try new things and um, not feel like there's any um, penalty associated with it. And you have to these days, right? I mean, these days you have to. There's, I don't think there's the option of being like, okay, I figured this out. I'm just going to do this this thing for 20 years, right? Those those days are gone. Um, how do you how do you feel? And this is a particularly appropriate for this conversation, um, but text, right? You remember in the day it was blogging and all that was the way forward. And you're lucky if you got an image in a blog post. Oh, it was, gosh. you know, all carefully worded and clever text. And, you know, the art, <laughs> the artisanship of the author and writing was key. Are mm -hmm. those days over? Are, have those, has text been killed by video and photographs on Instagram and <laughs> short acronym-esque posts on Facebook? Is it, is, 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 are, is prose dead now? <laughs> So as a, as a daughter of an English teacher, I think I'm going to be uh, uh, <laughs> cut out of my family if I, <laughs> if I uh, drown out the world of uh, the written, the written word, word uh, yeah. in this podcast. But I think that um, I feel like it is a moment where visual language um, is dictating where attention goes. Um, and at the same time, um, without careful and clever captions and, you know, thoughtful context, which really can only usually be done um, through the written, written word or the spoken word, um, mm -hmm. I think those those images get misinterpreted and perhaps lead to people being canceled and, you know, all, all other kinds of like dangerous and risky things. And so I think that, you know, visuals don't live in a bubble. Um, and fortunately, um, for those of us who love writing and love reading, um, you know, sort of that context and um, captioning is critical in order, even in the social media landscape, um, in order for them to be successful. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, even in the reading world, because I love to read as well. Uh, but lately, you know, as as I, I'm starting to lose vision a little bit, you know, since these glasses, you know, my arms aren't long enough anymore. So, um, 
But you know, but but the the saving grace of that, you know, in reading and not getting your ti- your tired eyes tearing all over the place, is Audible and things like that, and being able to con- consume text based content, but. You know, someone's reading it to you. I'm yes. curious from someone in your position is are those kinds of implementations part of the strategy or is it all visual based as we look forward or or can it be audio and non visually oriented? Yeah, I think audio is having a major moment and I, I feel like it's, it has been having one, but it, but really in many ways, the pandemic accelerated that. Um, I think so much of, you know, sort of Zoom fatigue um, around, you know, people um, spending all their days staring at a screen led to a difficulty with, um, you know, continuing to, okay, now we're going to watch something. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I've been watching something all day and it's like my own face, you know? (laughs) So, um, and so I think that a lot of times, um, what we saw, and this is proven out in the data and we, again, in the state of the story, we have a a chapter on podcasting and sort of the future of audio as well, but there's, um, a real moment around social audio, right? And so clubhouse was of course the very first, um, sort of, breakout success story in audio social networks, but you saw a lot of follow-ons within existing products like Slack or Twitter um, or Spotify um, that now have audio social communities um, and they are, you know, gaining momentum and participation. Um, And then you saw Audible and most book publishers as, you know, we work with a few like HarperCollins, for example. Um, So a huge uptick in their, audiobook sales. Um, again, largely in my view, because people were just screened out. They were, you know, ready to, um, you know, listen to something soothing and interesting and intellectually stimulating, or maybe even funny or sad or, you know, whatever, um, medium, if it was either informational or entertaining, um, they were there to listen. Um, and they wanted to do it during, you know, cooking or working out or (laughs) falling asleep at night. Um, And that was, uh, you know, a necessary consumption pattern um, that I think we all got used to. And, um, you know, while not everyone was commuting last year, I think that um, we had other down moments where audio really took took on um, a center stage moment. Yeah, no, no, I agree. It's so interesting. I knew I kind of had a feeling you were going to say that, and I knew you were going to say text isn't dead either. Um, all right, so let's let's shift gears and look to the future. To what what does the future look like? And you're again the perfect person to ask this question to. You said Magna Media has been around for a couple of decades now, um, and you've seen patterns. I would assume you've seen patterns in the chaos over time and things repeating, and so you. You know, if there is a better person to ask this question, I don't know who it is, of what does the future of these kinds of, you know, the, the digital storytelling and brand storytelling, you know, factoring in, you know, you, I know you know everyone in almost every company out there, right? So what what does it look like? Like, what does 2020 or 2030 look like? Are we all going to be, you know, creating everything with phones, mobile phones at that point? Is Are we going to be living in virtual worlds and interacting through headsets? You know what, you know, and consuming brand content that way? You know, what, 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 what does it look like? What do you think? I mean, I think 2030, there is, first of all, a phenomenal book. We've had the pleasure of hosting him at one of our um, events um, called 2030. And the author is Mauro Gillen. And he just did a phenomenal job to, at looking strategically around um, sort of global data in births and deaths and you know economic trends and um, technological trends and sort of merged it all together in this view. And he said, he confessed that you know he'd been ri- writing this book ahead of the pandemic. And so when the pandemic hit, everything accelerated and really it's not 2030 any longer. A lot of his predictions are now he's looking at becoming true in 2025, yeah. um, which is just crazy. Yeah. The, it, the acceleration is that um, is happening that quickly. Um, but then in, in a more, you know, sort of um, focused way, I would say, as far as like what, what the marketer or the business leader can expect um, in a 2022 and beyond fashion, I think we see really three recurring themes. I think we're seeing that audiences are expecting um, much more sort of like self-service experiences, um, whether that be, you know, through, you know, sort of um, 
self checkout at a you know sort of retail experience or um, if you're you know um, looking for um, help on your SaaS platform at work and you know you don't want to have to search a million tutorials or you know wait on hold of an 800 number back in the day right it's more um, dynamic um, in terms of the way in which companies and products and services are interacting with their consumers um, so that's one thing that we've seen um, impact Empowering the consumer to, and whether that's a B2B consumer or a B2C consumer, um, really have um, more discovery, more learning, and more connection um, as they're engaging with your product. I think mm -hmm. those are critical um, transformations. I think the second thing is that audiences are seeking out um, more trustworthy content. I mean, trust has been hit hard um, over the last few years, especially um, since 2016. And, and, you know, business leaders and politicians have lost tremendous trust. Even the media has lost trust. And so, you know, there's been a number of dynamics and a lot written about those um, different sort of you know, former uh, domains that were um, beacons of power and authority um, and how that has now shifted to be much more peer oriented. Um, and I think, you know, again, on a practical level, what you're seeing in the marketing community is that that now means that influencers are at an all time high, that creators at are, are at an all time high in terms of their power um, for helping you build trust. Um, and then the third is really an engagement, you know, engagement as, as we formerly know, have known it, you know, whether it was when you and I, you know, were working um, at, you know, in, in capacity with Apple or um, Adobe or any of these, you know, engagement used to mean like, okay, does someone like, you know, use our software and are they, you know, really like, you know, using all the features, right? And, and I think as social media has really taken over um, so much of our interpersonal connection for better or worse, um, it's now a battleground for brands that engagement is um, something that people are thinking about um, in terms of, you know, their competitors having a dominant role on TikTok when they were only formerly working in Instagram. And, you know, Snap has all new possibilities in terms of AR and video and how you combine those two things together. And so I think that, that it's a um, real war for ideas um, when it comes to most industries and most categories and engagement is really how um, that war is being measured in terms of success. Yeah, yeah, there's so much to cover, so much to talk. I have a list of things that I wanted to throw at you. I know we, I gotta, I'm being respectful of your time, but one of the things that I took out of what you just said, Megan, is you were saying, um, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but you're saying podcasters like me are the yes. future. I think yes. you're trying to tell me, right? That's exactly it. I was basically just creating like a poster with your face in the middle of it. Frederick and say like, that's the future yeah. right there. 2030. It's you, dude. It's you. The face, the face <laughs> of, uh, or the voice at least, right? Of the influencer. No, um, well, I mean, you're being you're being humble but the reality is look you've always had a, a sense of where things are going and, and and you know and and spent a lot of your you know personal energy on that and i really respect that because i think that you know we what we can't predict as individual artists or you know storytellers or um business you know people what we can't predict is what's the horizon um through which these things really take off and and become you know sort of meaningful um in terms of audience or income or any of those um you know sort of dimensions but i do think that you know without a doubt like you've always been someone who i've admired because of your authenticity and your um you know power to listen to what um, changes are happening and how you connect those dots um, between your personal interests and what, what changes are happening. So I think that that's a lot of what is working right now is people are there, you know, they, their BS detector is on high alert when it comes yeah. to, especially millennials or Gen Z, they've seen so much um, catastrophe, frankly, that, that older generations are, have, um, either tolerated or been responsible for creating. And so um, they're not interested any longer in sort of like these false idols. And I think um, it's a wake up call to a lot of people who are formerly very comfortable in their positions and, and saying, oh, guess what? There's a lot of um, you know ground we need to make up. There's a lot of um, you know opening of, of um, our lens in terms of who we should be listening to, who we should be empowering um, if we wanna stay relevant.
Yeah, I agree. And and thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that, especially coming from you. So thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious as to what you think about the kind of the zeitgeist or the feeling right now, because there's, you know, obviously, as we record, this is October 4th in 2021. So we're hopefully at the tail end of the pandemic, who knows, right? Um, but there's this, yeah, fingers crossed, but there's this pandemic thing going on, which which contributes to uncertainty and all the, you know, the bad stuff that came along with that. And like you mentioned, there's political uncertainty. We don't trust our politicians. We don't trust media. Uh, you know, in any number of other forces that are pressing down on the planet's populace right now, including global warming and all these different stressors in the economy, et cetera. And the feeling that I I've see, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious what you think about this sitting where you sit. One of the things that I see is there's a, a, a kind of a renewed sense of urgency, you know, mm -hmm. for you know, kind of, I'm not gonna, ha I don't have all the time in the world now. You know, the planet doesn't have all the time. People are passing away. I may not have all the time in the world. I need to get stuff done now. Are yeah. you are you seeing that, you know, in, in the circles that you move in, your constituency, your employees, your, your clients and all that? I absolutely am. Yes, I feel mm -hmm. like, um, you know, I would put it under the theme of like the time is now. <laughs> yeah. And in many ways, you know, it is a carpe diem moment. And, and you know, and, and I think a lot of those things were like platitudes that many of us knew and like, yeah, it's like, oh, life is short and whatever kind of thing. And then you start to see, oh my God, like life is truly short. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, we are reading obituaries from, you know, loved ones and from, you know, celebrities in the same sentence, like every single day, it is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that didn't need to die in this country, millions globally, mm -hmm. um, who many of whom, over, you know, outside of the US who don't even have access to a vaccine, forget wanting to or not wanting to, but that, yeah. like it's not even a possibility. And so I think that, um, you know, those of us who are, are privileged um, to be healthy and able to, um, you know, sort of take the world by storm on a day by, by day basis, you know, we're leaning into that opportunity. And there's, there is a electricity, I would say, in terms of um, the type of ideas and energy and actions. And and it's no longer, you know, let's sit around at a big conference table and sort of, you know, stare at, at one another and, you know, spitball ideas for six months and maybe or maybe not, we'll, you know, get a campaign off the ground. It, it's like, you know, can we get started on this? This is the idea. What do you think? Can yeah. you make it better? And like, let's do it like next month, you know? <laughs> and so I think there is that tremendous urgency thank you for for using that word because i think that that's exactly what it is um within the business community and then within the consumer world i think people are saying that it's feeling the same thing they're thinking you know i don't want to miss out on you know this live exclusive event um that may never be you know available anywhere else because it's disappearing content or um i don't want to um you know lose the pulse of you know my interpersonal connections and you know we're seeing so much more connective tissue between people um who are even you know remote and and it may be in different parts of the world but are connected yeah. with one another so i feel like there is an excitement um associated with um that revelation that our days are numbered um as much as it's it's also dark and and difficult and um full of tragedy that you know the flip side of that is um you know we're not taking things for granted yeah um, no absolutely and i i personally lost two family members of the past 18 months, two years, my sister and my dad. And I'll tell you, both of them, uh, before they passed away, the main regret that they had, can you guess what it was? The not having done the stuff that they wanted to get done. Like my sister had a forever house on her list and now no forever house, right? And my dad wanted to go on trips around the country in a you know, a, a Winnebago or something and visit and never was able to do that. And this is because they kept putting it off. It was like, oh, yeah, I'll get to it. Maybe next year. Well, I want to do this first and I'll get to it. And that was the one lesson. I think I, I mentioned this in my dad's eulogy, right? The one of the main lessons that I took away from all this horrificness over the past couple of years has been 
like you said, no time like the present. Our days are numbered. Don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. And that kind of lends into all this stuff that we're talking about in this conversation about the tools and the distribution mechanisms and the desire and the thirst of all that is in the industry right now, right? It's all out there, right? All you gotta do is, okay, put off Netflix for a day or so and go do something for real, you know, make some content or, you know, however you wanna approach it. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's eye-opening to hear you say that and it's like, okay, yeah, the time is now for us to do stuff. What is, what is, so we're, we're, like I said, we're in, in the beginning of October, 2021 now. Where do you see Magnet Media in a couple of years from now? You know, mm-hmm. as, as you look forward, knowing what we know now and all the anarchy that's happening in the world now and leaning into things and experimenting and new technologies and phones are getting better and better, all this stuff. What do we, what does your 2025 look like for Magnet Media? Oh my goodness. Well, I will answer that question, but first of all, I need to express, I'm so sorry to hear that story about your sister and your dad. And I want to send you a virtual hug. Thank you. I'm taking in it person, in person <laughs> somewhere, yes. somewhere soon. Um, Magnet Media is um, on a really exciting growth trajectory and with more I would say, uh, impressive talent that I've ever been privileged to work alongside and with. And so, I mean, as far as like the next five years, I feel like, you know, the possibilities are limitless in some ways. And in many ways, it's not really up to me, um, largely because it is a a team effort. Um, But I'll say as far as from like a vision perspective, you know, what I see happening and what I want to um, help to continue to foster and support is really that um, the worlds of, you know, sort of formally known as entertainment and media, um, traditional entertainment and media, which were, you know, largely advertising based, um, let's call it what it is, Mm -hmm. um, are um, really converging with the formerly known as branded content um, at the storytelling level. And so as we start to see those two worlds, you know, coming coming together, um, we are cross pollinating with, you know, such gifted and talented um, speech writers and, you know, script writers and visionary, uh, you know, designers and uh, directors and producers and musicians and uh, music supervisors and all the kinds of talent that I don't think we ever anticipated, um, at least not in my lifetime, um, having access to. But where where all of that is going, um, I don't have like sort of a precise, you know, prescription, but I will say that I feel like branded content is on a path to rival the quality of storytelling that entertainment and media is known for. Um, And that is tremendously exciting for everyone involved, um, including consumers, uh, because if we can have content being underwritten in a true and honest way, in an authentic way, um, with diverse representation, with diverse voices, um, you know, being behind the camera and in front of it, I think that that is a future that I'm really excited about and would really enjoy living in. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, there's so much to do. So much to do. Yeah, the, one of the, uh, and I'll end with this, one of the um, conversation, conversations I had recently was about, it was with a younger photographer and we we're just sort of talking about creativity and, and how a lot of photographers and or content creators, right, get kind of stifled and stuck in a box and not sure what to do next. And you end up taking pictures of flowers and a bee and a long exposure of the dock and making it black and white. So you start, you start falling into these old tropes again, just to kind of satisfy your, your photography thirst. Um, And then I propose the idea of kind of following what Marvel and DC have done, right? So why not create your own cinematic universe? for yourself and create creative works within the, the that world, the dogma of that world. Why not create things based on the physics and the characters and, you know, whether whether it be, you know, you're telling some sort of sociopolitical message or it's complete fiction or it's a love story. Why not create a world and then do little vignettes within that world? So 
that kind of thing excites me, you know, to be able to say, okay, I'm going to, because I used to read and write short stories as a kid. So I'm thinking, man, I could, I could create this world. And then now it makes sense. The flower that I'm photographing, I can weave a story around that. It makes sense in my world because this is why that flower is there. It has a reason for being versus it's just a flower, right? I mean, I love that so much. And I feel like that it pulls into the threads that I, you know, um, probably poorly articulated earlier around, you know, when you're asking about these different components of storytelling of text and, um, you know, visuals and all these different things. It's like, you know, when you when you say that you're creating a world, I mean, that to me is the ultimate um, storytelling experience, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's something where um, everybody can touch and feel and know where, you know, the different dynamics are between characters and objects. And, um, you know, really, it, it's an invitation more than yeah. anything else. And I think that that is um, something that to me has always been um, part and parcel with the best storytelling is that it's it's co-creating with with your audience um, yeah. and you know I think that I can't wait to see what you do with it from a photography standpoint because that just yeah. sounds so inspiring. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be fun. I mean, it's interesting because, like you said, it, then it it weaves all these different things that that were disparate together. So now, you know, who's to say that? A, a story from this world that you put together is just text you know this is just going to be text i'm just going to write this up maybe it's audio maybe it's audio and video maybe it's video maybe it's animation maybe it's a composite photograph this time and the uh, the other piece of it was i was thinking um you know kind of taking a page out of the the music industry or the old school music industry where the or even movie the movie industry where movies are released with a certain cadence um or a big album back in the day was released a certain way and you knew that this album was coming out from this particular artist but all the music from that particular artist is in the genre that you enjoy why why don't today's creatives that are photographers or videographers or, or whatnot kind of play into that release schedule as well, along with the cinematic world. So now you have your world and now, hey, Megan's gonna release this thing on Friday the whatever. It's the latest, you're gonna find out what this character in her world is up to because she left a cliffhanger the last time and then boom, 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 boom. And you just create in perpetuity like that, so. I don't know. Putting a lattice work for the vine to climb on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, and it's such it is such a, a an apt description of I think what the possibilities are um, ahead of us. So again, I I really I cannot wait to see what you and hopefully your listeners are able to do with that kind of invitation because it's it's it just seems incredibly exciting. Yeah, it should be fun. So what what is next for you, for Megan? Like after we hang up from this call, we're Monday <laughs> here. So I'm sure you got a big week ahead of you. What's what's on the immediate horizon for you and Magna Media? Oh my gosh. That well, we have um I, I alluded to it earlier, but we have a you know, an annual trends report called the State of the Story. And yeah. every year we have a summit um that takes place during advertising week. Um and so we're gearing up for that summit this year. Um, and that's been a big, it's always a big, um, exciting lift, but also full of twists and turns as there's so many, um, sort of people from the tech world, from the creative world, from the brand world, um, that all get together and just, you know, sort of put their heads together. And this year we have folks from Netflix and the chief creative officer from Walmart and, um, a number of venture capitalists and startups. And some of which are just getting their brands off the ground and others, which have, um, just recently IPO. would So it's a huge journey. And I think um, our theme this year is really around um, storytelling, driving growth, um, but growth in the in the best sense, not necessarily just Wall Street's definition of growth, but, um, you know, growth at, at, as humans. Um, <laughs> yes. So um really looking forward to that and that's that is what is all consuming for me right now um and um i hope that you will join us and i hope that um your listeners will, will join us as well as that takes place in, in a few weeks absolutely yeah and yeah give me all the information i'll put it in the the description for or the the show notes for this episode and in the youtube description as well um always a pleasure chatting with you when i come to new york we're hanging we gotta have a glass of wine or something so yeah it's gotta happen it's gonna very, happen so very yeah. soon. all right Megan, thank you so thank much you for taking this time. thank you so much frederick for having me it's been a real pleasure talking to you today i appreciate it so much
You're welcome. You're welcome. And good luck with everything. And we'll talk soon. This is Twitter. This episode was sponsored by MPB, the world's largest online platform for used photo and video kit. Visit mpb.com.